morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning as we gather together once again to worship God. A very warm welcome to all of you, particularly if you're visiting us uh, this morning. It's great to have you here. Let me just share a few announcements uh, as we get underway this morning. We're going to be turning to the book of Isaiah a little bit later on. We're continuing our series uh, in this great book of the Bible, uh, coming to chapter 5 this morning. And then our service this evening is at six o'clock and we'll be continuing in our series in mark's gospel on wednesday evening there's our prayer gathering at half past seven and uh, we'll be continuing with our series in the song of songs uh, and then on thursday morning there is uh, mums and toddlers at half past ten on friday there's no relate uh, this week but everything planned as normal for next sunday quarter past ten for the sunday school Half past 11 for the morning service, which Ethan will be taking. We'll be in 2 Timothy once again. And then 6 o'clock for the evening service, and I'll be preaching at that service in Mark's Gospel. A few um, advanced notices as well for things uh, coming up later this month. The Women's Bible Study is on Tuesday the 21st of March uh, at uh, 10 a.m. That's here, and study sheets will be available in the foyer. Uh, the women's uh, meeting uh, Tuesday the 28th of March uh, here at church at 8 o'clock and as well as that uh, a couple of other new ministries which we're going to be God willing launching uh, this month uh, Ethan is heading these things up uh, first of all a young adults lunch uh, an opportunity uh, on a, a quarterly basis for young adults in the church those who consider themselves young adults uh, in the church to get together for a, a bring and share lunch uh, the first of those is scheduled for the 26th of March over at David and Elizabeth's. So young adults do have that date in your diary. Uh, and then as well as that, we're, we're planning to relaunch uh, our seniors lunch. Uh, the first uh, of those, again, on a quarterly basis initially, will be on Monday the 27th of March at 12 noon uh, here at the church. Two other things just very quickly. Uh, to have uh, in your diary. Our church weekend away down at, at Castle Wellen uh, is booked for the 19th to the 21st of May. Uh, and the, the Saturday before that, the, the 13th of May, the Presbytery Day Conference is going to be taking place here. And if uh, you want to book for that, you can do so through the EPC website. Apologies for the, the long list of uh, announcements there, but if there's any more information you need about those things, do uh, have a word with me afterwards. I'm going to read some verses from John chapter 15 as our call to worship uh, this morning. As I mentioned, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5 later on, uh, this wonderful song about the Lord's vineyard. And of course, in John chapter 15, uh, Jesus refers to himself as, as the true vine. Uh, the one uh, who bears fruit and in whom we can bear fruit uh, as well. So hear these words from John chapter 15. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I'll be referring to those words later on in our service as we consider Isaiah 5 and how Jesus is the, the fulfillment ultimately of the vineyard of the Lord. We're going to sing together as our first item of praise this morning, Psalm 80. This is a psalm, again, that we're going to refer to a number of times this morning. The reason being that the, the psalmist who wrote this psalm uh, really based it upon Isaiah chapter 5, the, the chapter that we're going to explore later on. He took the words from Isaiah's song in Isaiah chapter 5 and, and reworked it and expanded it into Psalm 80. And so as we read and study Isaiah 5 this morning, we'll do so alongside Psalm 80 and see how these two passages are interconnected with one another. We're going to sing up to verse 7. So it's the first five stanzas as it's printed in the, the hymn book. It's version A. Hear, O Israel's shepherd, 
hear us. Joseph, like a flock you lead, you who are enthroned in glory, shine upon us in our need. Psalm 80, version A, and we'll sing the first five stanzas of it, verses 1 to 7. We'll stand and sing. Do take a seat. Come to God in prayer now. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather before you this morning to worship you, and as we approach you in prayer now through your Son, Jesus, we call to mind those words of his that we have heard already this morning from John chapter 15 where he says that he is the true vine and that apart from him, we can do nothing. And Father, we acknowledge that apart from Jesus, our lives cannot produce the fruit of righteousness that you delight to see. And we confess that even as those in Christ, we are not as fruitful as we ought to be. And at times it's necessary for you to prune us, cutting away things in our lives that only prevent us from bringing forth the fruit that we are called to produce. And yet we thank you that as those who abide in Christ, those united to him through faith, that his very life now flows in us and brings forth the fruit that you delight in. And so we pray for ourselves, Father, that as we abide in your Son, Jesus, who is the true vine, And as we, the branches, are united to him, that we would be a fruitful people. We pray that in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit would burst forth. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. May these things come to characterize our lives individually, and as well as that, the fellowship of our church corporately. May we be filled with the fruit of righteousness for your glory's sake. And we pray that even for those who are in difficult days, those who are grieving, those who are afflicted, those struggling with ill health, those in later years in life, that by your grace you would cultivate in their hearts the fruit that you desire to see, even in challenging times. We remember the words of Psalm 92. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. 
They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. And they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And Father, it's our longing that others as well who are as yet outside of Christ would be grafted into him and through hearing his word that they would come to put their faith in Jesus and abide in him and therefore bear fruit. And we pray that therefore in this place we would see a mighty work of God performed as people from this community are brought under the sound of the gospel and turn to Jesus, put their faith in him. Pour out your grace in this way, we pray. Because we ask it all in Jesus' name and for your glory's sake. Amen. And hear these words of encouragement that we find in Philippians chapter 1, Paul's words to the church there. He says, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, we're going to sing again now as we turn to hymn number 104. I found the pearl of greatest price, my heart sings out for joy, and sing I must, for Christ is mine. Christ shall my song employ. Let's stand and sing. Please take a seat and please could you turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah as we come back to this book once again this morning we're in chapter 5 we're going to read a few verses from the start of this chapter Isaiah chapter 5 starting there at verse 1 
And Isaiah writes, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. We finish there at verse 7 this morning in Isaiah chapter 5. And as always, we ask for God's blessing upon the reading and preaching of his word. Now let me invite the boys and girls to come and grab a seat here on the front row as I speak to them for a few minutes.
sing uh, hymn number 297 stand and sing these words together <laughs> Please take a seat and let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and in particular this section of it in Isaiah chapter 5. And we pray that as your word goes forth now, that your spirit would do his work in and through the preacher. 
and in the hearts of all who hear, that righteous fruit may abound for your glory's sake, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please do have your Bible open there at Isaiah chapter 5, and those first seven verses of the chapter that we've read already. And this morning we're going to look together at the words of this love song. You could argue that the, the love song is in fact the oldest form of human communication. In the Bible, the very first words that we hear a human being speak are of course the words of a love song. When Adam first laid eyes on Eve in Genesis chapter 2, there in the Garden of Eden, he sings a love song for his beloved. And still today, all these years later, if you were to listen to the music charts, I'm sure that the vast majority of the songs that make up the top 40 at any given moment would fall into the category of being love songs of one kind or another. This is a powerful form of communication. And Isaiah says here at the start of chapter 5, I'm going to sing a love song. He says, let me sing for my beloved, my love song. And immediately, of course, we, we want to ask, well, Isaiah, who is your beloved? Who is the object of your love? And later on in the song, we find out the Lord is Isaiah's beloved. And this love song, you see, springs from a heart that is filled with love for God. And like any true believer, Isaiah loves God from the very depths of his heart. And therefore, he wants to sing about God and he wants to sing to God. Earlier in our service, we, we sang these words, didn't we? I found the pearl of greatest price. My heart sings out for joy. And sing I must, for Christ is mine. Christ shall my song employ. Isaiah could join in heartily with those words, couldn't he? He loves his Lord. And that love for God overflows in song. And yet this love song takes us by surprise because most love songs have in view the relationship that exists between the lover and the beloved. And so you expect that Isaiah is going to sing about that relationship, his love for God and God's love for him in return. And yet notice that this love song takes a different approach. This song has in view not the relationship between Isaiah and the Lord, but rather the relationship between the Lord and his vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. It's a, a strange concept for a love song, isn't it? To sing about a, a vineyard. And that raises a, a further question, doesn't it? But what is this vineyard that Isaiah is referring to in the love song? Well, again, later on in the song, we find out uh, the vineyard represents the people of Israel in general and the people of Judah in particular, where Isaiah was ministering. And in this love song, Isaiah is going to sing about that relationship that exists between the Lord and Israel. So we're going to listen to this love song and notice various things from it. And the first is this. The Lord planted his vineyard. The Lord planted his vineyard. Isaiah begins the, the main part of the song with these words. My beloved had a, a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. So imagine a man who decides he, he wants to start a new vineyard. What does he do? Well, the first thing he does is that he finds a suitable location for it. it needs to be rich, fertile ground where the, the vines will flourish. And preferably, he, he wants to find a, a nice south-facing 
hillside, where they'll get plenty of sunshine so that the grapes will grow. And when he's found that perfect location, he purchases it, and then he gets to work on the land. He must dig it over. He must clear it of stones. He must get rid of anything in that land that would prevent his vineyard from being as fruitful as it could possibly be. And then having cleared the land of those things, he can now safely plant his vines there and allow them to take root in this ideal location. And Isaiah says that is what the Lord has done for his vineyard, the people of Israel. The Lord, first of all, identified the ideal location for them. He'd had his eye on it for a long time. He showed it to Abraham. He said to Abraham, this is the land that your descendants will possess in the end. And he showed it to Moses. He said, this is the land to which the people of Israel will go. A beautiful land, a fruitful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then in time, the Lord cleared the ground for his people. Through the leadership of Joshua, the Lord drove out from the promised land the people who were living there previously. These people were, were guilty of the most heinous sins, the most corrupt idolatry you could imagine. And God drove out the people from before his people. And then he planted his people there. He put them in that ideal land so that they could put their roots down there, so to speak. Enjoy life in the land that God had so graciously given to them. And Psalm 80, which we sang earlier on, reflects all of this. You may want to have Psalm 80 open in front of you as well. How the, the psalmist takes this language of Isaiah, 5's and, Isaiah 5 and he, he reworks it into the words of his psalm. He says, you brought out a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nation." And planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Put simply, the Lord planted his vineyard. And then notice this. The Lord protected his vineyard. Look at the, the next line of Isaiah's song. Isaiah says of his beloved, he built a watchtower in the midst of it. And so his beloved did not just plant the vineyard and then leave it to its own devices to try and look after itself. No, the point of the watchtower is that the person who owns the vineyard is able to keep watch over the vineyard, protect it from anything that would harm it. The threat of wild animals coming into the vineyard, trampling on the vines and eating the fruit, or thieves breaking in to, to steal the fruit for themselves. The vineyard needs protecting from these things, and the watchtower is there to provide protection for the vineyard. And in a somewhat similar way, Isaiah is saying that his beloved, the Lord, protected his people, Israel, he didn't just give them the promised land and then leave them there to try and look after it themselves and take care of themselves. No, far better than that, he made his dwelling amongst them. He watched over them. He protected them through various different means, through prophets and priests and kings and so forth. God provided every protection that his people needed so that they would be kept safe from anything that would harm them. And with the Lord on their side, their enemies would be driven back. Idolatry would be stamped out. Sin would be dealt with. And the vineyard would be maintained so long as they kept entrusting themselves to the Lord who was keeping watch over them. The Lord protected his vineyard. And then thirdly, notice this. The Lord had a purpose for his vineyard. Look at how the song continues. And he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. What is a vineyard for? 
The vineyard has a purpose, doesn't it? And the purpose is obvious. A vineyard is for producing fruit, namely grapes. And the man in the song who had planted this vineyard and who had protected this vineyard rightly expected that fruit would be produced by the vineyard. He expected that his purpose in doing all of these things for his vineyard would be fulfilled. He was expecting a harvest of grapes. And therefore, notice, he he hewed out a wine vat in order to store all the wine from the grapes that he was expecting. And then a couple of years later, when the, the vines had had chance to grow and become established, he goes out to inspect the vines and to gather the grapes. And you see, Isaiah is saying the Lord had a purpose for his vineyard, the people of Israel. There was a reason why he took that vine out of Egypt and cleared the land of Canaan and planted his people there. He wanted to see fruitfulness amongst them. And you might ask, well, what does the the fruit represent? And again, the end of the song makes it clear. The fruit that the Lord expected to be produced by his vineyard, the people of Israel, was justice and righteousness. That is his purpose in all of this, that there would be a people on earth who would reflect the very character of God himself who is by his own nature perfectly righteous, entirely just. And as they lived in the land that he had given to them, living in relationship with their God, obeying his laws, walking in his ways, they would bring forth the fruit of justice and righteousness that he delights in. That was God's purpose in planting the vineyard and protecting his vineyard. And how did it play out in reality. Well, this is where the the love song, you see, hits a a sour note, literally. The end of verse 2. But it yielded wild grapes. Literally, the the word there for wild grapes is stinking grapes. Imagine this man who has planted a vineyard, protected the vineyard, and done so for the purpose of fruitfulness for his vineyard. And he goes out to gather the grapes, to make the wine, to store in his wine vat. And instead, what he finds is stinking, rotten, sour grapes all through the whole vineyard. And the point that Isaiah is making is obviously this. This is what the Lord's vineyard, the people of Israel and Judah, had become. They were the Lord's planting. He had protected them over the years. His purpose for them was that they be fruitful, that they bring forth justice and righteousness. And yet the kind of fruit that the Lord wanted from them was not the kind of fruit that they were producing. And Isaiah sums it all up in verse 7. He says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, But behold, bloodshed for righteousness. But behold, an outcry. And in the first few chapters of the book, we've already seen the way in which the people of Israel and Judah in Isaiah's day had become estranged from their God. They had become mixed up in idolatry. They had become mired in immorality. They defied God. They celebrated sin. They oppressed the poor. They disregarded God's commands. And it's like the vineyard of the Lord was just producing stinking, rotten grapes instead of the pleasant fruit of justice and righteousness. And the point of verses 3 and 4 is that none of this is the Lord's fault. The Lord says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? The answer is that there was nothing more that the Lord could have done for his vineyard that he had not done for it. He had extended every privilege to his people. 
He had been abundantly gracious to them. Grace after grace after grace had been lavished upon them. And Isaiah has shown us these three particular acts of grace towards the vineyard. The Lord planted them, he protected them, and he had a purpose for them to produce fruit. And why then did the vineyard produce only these stinking grapes? And the answer is that the the fault lies entirely with the people themselves because they have thrown God's favour back in his face. They were given so many privileges. They were given so many opportunities to hear the word of God. So many opportunities to benefit from God's goodness towards them. But again and again and again, they hardened their hearts against God. They ignored his grace. They went their own way. And you know, it's bad enough for anybody to turn away from God and to live a life of unrighteousness. But how scandalous and how dreadful a thing it is to be someone who has been granted privileged access to the things of God. His grace held out to you. And yet still to turn from him and fail to produce the fruit that he desires. And so what is going to happen next to this vineyard? As a consequence. Well, that's the fourth thing we see in this song, and that is that the Lord will punish his vineyard. The Lord will punish his vineyard. Look at verses five and six. Notice from those verses three particular ways in which the Lord says he's going to act in judgment against the vineyard. Notice these three acts of judgment. The first is that he will remove the vineyard's protection. Verse 5, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. We discover here not only had this man built a watchtower for the protection of the vineyard, as well as that he'd planted a hedge around it and then he'd built a wall around it as well. How much care he had shown to the vineyard. How well protected it was. And yet now he says he's going to get rid of the hedge. He's going to break down the wall. So that all protection is removed from the vineyard. And then the wild animals can trample through. And they can devour the fruit for themselves. He's going to remove the protection. But then secondly, he's going to let the vineyard go to waste. He had so carefully planted and cared for this choice vine. And yet now he's just going to let it become uncared for, wild, uncultivated. He says, I will make it a waste and it shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. And so within a few years, you'll not even be able to tell that there was ever a vineyard there because it will have just returned to the wild. What was once the vineyard will become indistinguishable from the surrounding lands, just blending in with the world around, no different. And then thirdly, he says he will withhold his blessing. He says, I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And of course, with no rain falling on it, there will be no harvest at all produced by this vine. No fruitfulness whatsoever. It will all just shrivel up. And I want you to notice how those three acts of judgment that are described in verses 5 and 6 correspond to those three acts of grace that we discover in verses 1 and 2. You see the connection between the grace and the corresponding judgment. The Lord planted his vineyard. And now he says, I will let it go to waste. The Lord protected his vineyard. And now he says, I will remove the hedge and the wall. And the Lord had a purpose for his vineyard, that it be fruitful. And now he says, no rain will fall upon it. Isaiah is saying the Lord will punish 
his vineyard, the people of Israel, for the way in which they have ignored and abused his grace. And in the rest of the chapter, he shows us what that punishment is going to look like in real terms. Because the Lord is going to send the Assyrian army against them. As it were, they will trample through the vineyard and they will devour the people. They will take the good things for themselves. And then about a hundred years later, the Babylonians would then come along and they too would trample through the vineyard and they would destroy everything in their way and they would carry the people into exile. And again, Psalm 80 which was written after that act of judgment had taken place, reflects the language of Isaiah 5. Because the, the psalmist cries out, Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. The Lord will punish the vineyard, warns Isaiah. And of course, there's a contemporary application of all of this as well. And that is that those who have privileged access to the grace of God in the gospel, and yet who harden their hearts against him, will experience the judgment of God in the end, just as Isaiah's generation did. And this is what it looks like. The Lord removes his protection from them. And over time, he allows them to become indistinguishable from the surrounding world. They become just like the world around them. And in the end, he withholds his blessings from them. Here you are this morning. You have privileged access to the grace of God in the gospel. I wonder, what will you do with it? And then there's one final thing to say. And that is that the Lord will keep his promises to the vineyard. He will keep his promises to the vineyard. Now this love song that Isaiah sings, it ends on a bitter note, literally. The Lord, his beloved, had planted and protected this vineyard for the purpose of creating a fruitful people. And yet because of their sin, the Lord would punish the vineyard at the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And yet is that the end of the story for the Lord's vineyard? Well, thankfully not. We need to remember what Isaiah has just said in the previous paragraph. We looked at it last week, didn't we? In chapter 4. And you remember how Isaiah spoke about the branch of the Lord which would bring forth glorious fruit. Yes, the vineyard of the house of Israel was producing rotten fruit, but growing up in the house of Israel, there was this one branch, this one individual, producing the fruit of righteousness that God desires. And so there is hope for the vineyard yet, hope found just in one person, one fruitful person whom I, Isaiah describes as the branch of the Lord. So there's a glimmer of hope back there in, in chapter 4. But then consider Psalm 80 once again. And as I've mentioned already a number of times, Psalm 80 borrows the language and the imagery of Isaiah chapter 5. But listen to what the psalmist says at the end of that psalm. He says, turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down, may they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man, whom you have made strong for yourself, then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. You see what the psalmist is crying out for? 
Yes, this vine has been cut down and trampled and burned in fire in that act of judgment. But he's crying out that that would not be the end of the story for the Lord's vine. And did you notice how he focuses his prayer upon an individual? He refers to this individual as the son whom you have made strong for yourself. The man of your right hand. The son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. And you see the psalmist is crying out, is there not hope yet for the Lord's vineyard, even after the judgment? Is there not hope yet for the Lord's vineyard for the sake of the Son of Man, who is at God's right hand? And then fast forward to the New Testament. I wonder, does Isaiah's love song remind you of something else in the Bible? Maybe it reminds you of Psalm 80, in which case you get bonus points. But I guess for, for most of us, Isaiah's song actually reminds us of something else in the Bible. Because it wasn't just the psalmist who took Isaiah's love song and reworked it into the words of Psalm 80. As well as that, Jesus took Isaiah's love song and he reworked it into one of his parables. It's the parable of the tenants. Jesus says, There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower. And then later, when this man looked for fruit, what did he find? There was bloodshed, culminating ultimately in the death of his own son. And so the owner of the vineyard would come in judgment to punish those who were guilty of not producing the fruit that he desired. And you see, it's exactly the same pattern as Isaiah chapter 5, isn't it? And yet notice what Jesus adds at the end of his parable. Because he takes the story of the vineyard one step further. And he shows there is still future hope for the vineyard. That longing of, of Psalm 80 that the judgment would not be the end of the story for the vineyard is fulfilled in Jesus' promise at the end of the parable of the tenants where Jesus says he will let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. And you see, God's purposes for the vineyard will not be frustrated even by sin and judgment. And in the end, the Lord's vineyard will produce the fruit that he desires. There will be a people of God living fruitful lives of justice and righteousness to the glory of God. Who is that renewed vineyard people? It is, of course, the church of Jesus Christ, consisting of all of those who are connected to him, the branch of the Lord and therefore producing the fruit that God desires as they abide in him. And by sheer grace, these people have been rescued from the judgment that they deserve. And they have been included in Christ, grafted into Jesus. Let me ask you as we close, are you connected to Jesus by faith in him? As it were, have you been grafted in to the branch of the Lord so that his life now flows in you and in him you produce the fruit of righteousness that God delights to see. Of course, that fruit of righteousness does not earn God's acceptance for you, not in any way. But the fruit of righteousness that is produced in the lives of God's people is the evidence that they belong to Jesus. You will know them by their fruits. Jesus says. Are you connected to Jesus? Are you joined to him by faith in him so that his life flows in you? And if so, you're a part of the vineyard now. You're a part of this people who are planted by God, 
and protected by God and for whom God has a purpose to bring forth the fruit of righteousness as they abide in Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for the words of this love song about your vineyard. We praise you for your grace in planting a people, protecting a people, and advancing your purposes amongst that people, that there might be a people of God on earth whose lives reflect you as they bring forth the fruit of righteousness. Father, we know that we've not produced the fruit of righteousness that we ought to have done, and our lives have been like rotten fruit, bringing forth unrighteousness. And so, like the psalmist, we cry out to you for the sake of the Son of Man who is at your right hand, whom you have made strong for yourself. And we cry out that you would restore us. And as we abide in Christ, may we bear the fruit that you delight to see for your glory's sake. And we thank you that by sheer grace, you have made even us a part of your vineyard. And may righteous fruits abound in our lives, because we ask it all in Jesus' name and for your glory's sake. Amen. We'll close by singing together hymn number 122. Um, o Jesus, we adore you. Upon the cross, our King, we bow our hearts before you. Your gracious name we sing. Let's stand and sing together. close remain standing and receive these words of benediction the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all now and forevermore amen mm -hmm.